Hello and welcome back to Analysis with me, Jonathan Steele. A court in Cairo has provoked international outrage with its controversial sentencing of a number of journalists. Charged with aiding the Muslim Brotherhood and reporting false news, the court took just 10 minutes to find three Al Jazeera journalists guilty and sentenced them to seven and 10 years, respectively. 11 others, including British journalist Sue Turton, were tried in absentia and sentenced to 10 years. The decision comes a day after another Egyptian court confirmed the death sentences against the leader of the outlawed Muslim Brotherhood and 182 of his supporters, causing serious fears for free speech and democracy in Egypt. On the eve of the Al Jazeera conviction, the US announced the release of $575 million worth of military aid to the Egyptian government. So what does all this mean for Egypt? And what should the international community do now? Well, to discuss these issues, I'm joined in the studio by Peter Oborn, the chief political columnist of the Daily Telegraph, and Mohammed Sudan, former foreign affairs spokesperson for the Muslim Brotherhood in Egypt. And on Skype, we have Andrew Smith, who's media coordinator of the Campaign Against the Arms Trade. Welcome to you all. But before we begin the discussion, let's take a look at this report. The three men had looked upbeat as they entered the courtroom in handcuffs, waving at family members who had earlier told journalists they expected them to be acquitted. But this was not to be, and there was a loud gasp of disbelief as the verdicts were read out to the group of caged defendants, including the three Al Jazeera journalists who had already spent six months in the notorious Torah prison. The three Al Jazeera journalists were yesterday sentenced to up to a decade in prison for endangering Egypt's national security after a trial that many described as having failed to provide any convincing evidence against them. The journalists who deny all the charges include Australian Peter Grest and Canadian Egyptian national Mohamed Fahmi, who both got seven years, and Egyptian producer Baha Mohammed, who received an additional three-year prison sentence on a separate charge involving possession of ammunition. Four others were also sentenced to seven years in prison, and a further 11 were sentenced in absentia to 10 years in prison. This is clear-cut corruption. It is a corrupt and politicized case, and everything is wrong. Wrong verdict. It's, um, I, I, don't, I, I don't know how the judge came to that decision. I'd be very interested to, to hear his, his reasons for giving that verdict. It doesn't make any sense. Amnesty International's Philip Luther described the trial as a complete sham, which provides further evidence that the Egyptian authorities will stop at nothing in the ruthless campaign to crush anyone who challenges the official narrative, regardless of how questionable the evidence against them is. Diplomatic ally US Secretary of State John Kerry described yesterday's verdict as chilling and draconian. But his condemnation comes a day after he met with the Egyptian foreign minister and the newly elected Egyptian president Abdel Fattah Sisi in Cairo and confirmed the return of US military and economic aid to Egypt. Some analysts have argued that yesterday's verdict represents a humiliation in US foreign diplomacy. Yet following the international outcry, the newly elected president showed no signs of backing down. <laughs> There was a lot of discussions yesterday about the sentencing. In my first telephone call with the Justice Minister, I told him we will not interfere in the ruling of the judiciary. And yesterday's sentencing also comes two days after an Egyptian court confirmed the death sentences of Mohammed Berdi, the leader of the now outlawed Muslim Brotherhood, and at least 182 of his supporters further discrediting Egypt's democratic credentials three years after the uprising that toppled Hosni Mubarak. The Secretary General is deeply concerned by recent court decisions in Egypt, particularly the confirmation of death sentences for 183 people and the sentencing of journalists, including from Al Jazeera today, to lengthy jail terms. Proceedings that clearly appear not to meet basic fair trial standards, particularly those resulting in the imposition of the death penalty, are likely to undermine prospects for long-term stability. The events of the last week come just two weeks after the former army chief took office as president and appear to show that his government will not be deterred in their attempts to eradicate dissent because of international pressure. Whether or not the international community will simply issue words of condemnation or start to consider stronger sanctions will be what many will now want to know. 
Okay, Peter. Um, I mean, is it possible to be a journalist working in Egypt now, do you think? I'm not a journalist in the way that most people in the world understand it, i.e. trying to report without fear or favour uh, the truth as you see it. That's the job of a journalist in uh, Egypt. Um, it's a criminal offence doing that sort of uh, journalism and you go to jail. I mean, clearly you can be a client journalist of the regime. Those kinds of journalism uh, still exist. But it's, it's fantastically dangerous, in, in fact, impossible openly. So do you think the government of Egypt is actually trying to get all journalists to leave and, and so they will have no reporting at all by, by foreign gov uh, reporters? I think, well, that, that is certainly the effect uh, of what they've done. It's terrifying now to report, bearing in mind that, you know, it, it's arbitrary. I mean, what it, it, Egyptian government's done more than that. Let's look beyond the narrow uh, parameters of, of, of journalism. It's an attack on civil society because, uh, uh, you know, so many Egyptian journalists uh, in jail, um, so many political activists who've done no more than sort of take part in political movements, are now defined as terrorists. And so the way I see it, uh, and it's very sad that Egypt, Egypt, which is a great nation, has turned its back on civilized values and humanity. And it's very disturbing um, in the little report you did earlier, which is, you know, the Americans are continuing to give arms to Egypt. Uh, Senator Kerry, who in many ways has been distinguished Secretary of State, uh, but get the, these announcements of arms to Egypt is really beyond the pale now. Um, we've had a... The, the, the Americans have been complicit with the coup d'etat of last July and the, um, and, the, and, and the military government, which has... The, the killings and then the military government and now the, these, uh, these, uh, the executions, which are now promised. Um, and uh, the, the British government has been pathetic as well. But Mohammed Sudan, I mean, coming on to these death sentences, 183 people, yeah. I mean, can they be appealed or is, is this now the end of the road? Yeah, this is according to the Egyptian law, yet any, any verdicts coming from the criminal court, you can, especially if it's sentenced to death, you can appeal, and if you don't appeal, defends himself, if he, de if he does not appeal for himself, then the prosecution directly go and appeal for him within 60 days. This is the law there. And how long does the appeal process take? This is the problem, because they will appear in the front of the Cassation Court. And the problem is the Cassation Court take a long time, sometimes maybe two years or one year and a half, take a long time. And of course long it's time. completely unlikely that they would have bail while they're waiting for the Cassation Court yeah, to come yeah, to a yeah, decision. This, this is a problem. So he has just to wait behind bars till the concession court take the decision. Either to, they cannot free him, but the concession court in, in their decision is to either to accept the verdict as is or to bring it back to another court from the beginning. From the beginning. And are there actually any Muslim Brotherhood people still free in Egypt, or are they all either in jail or forced to leave the country? Now we have at least 42,000 people behind bars in 102, 102 prison in 42, Egypt. 42,000 Muslim Brotherhood people? No, not, not all of them Muslim Brotherhood, but is it, there are plenty of them, maybe 50%, 60% from the 42,000 people. But we have more than 100,000 people being wanted from the Muslim Brotherhood. Me, myself, I, I have a five cases against me. Not only one, and it already gets 10 years census and two years census. This is the, the three from five. And I have another, I don't know exactly what is the uh, explanation for them then. It, it's easy, it's free. They, they spread it for free in Egypt now, the vertex. It's, it's something crazy. We don't have a, a justice in Egypt. We don't have a real judiciary in Egypt right now. They are always now they are like the verdicts, or I mean the, uh, the courts or the, the supreme, even supreme judges now, they work for the army, they work for the, the coup d'etat in Egypt, they follow the orders, that's it. So there's no chance that the Cassation Court, you think, would 
throughout these cases? Yeah, it's, or it's different because always the uh, judges who work, they are supreme judges who do work in the uh, concession court, and, and maybe they could not buy them as they buy the others in the criminal court. Mm -hmm. We wish that because it's going to be horrible. We have till now at least more than 250 people sentenced to death. It was like in 1,200, and then they drop it to like 250 people. Since to this, this is final. Well, Andrew Smith, I mean, you're in the campaign against the arms trade. I mean, uh, we know that uh, John Kerry, the US Secretary of State, has called these verdicts against the journalists chilling and draconian. Do you think he's now going to pull back on the, the arms sales that he announced just the day oh. before? Well, we would certainly hope so. Um, I mean, the main point to make is that arms sales don't just give a military support to governments like the government in Egypt. They also give a strong political support and a political endorsement as well. And I think actually what uh, John Kerry's announcement showed is that actually human rights hasn't been at the heart of arms export policy because what has happened to the Al Jazeera journalists is very serious, and quite rightfully, it's getting a lot of attention, but it hasn't happened in isolation. There was an interesting report in The Guardian last week which suggested that there's actually over 16,000 political prisoners um, who've been arrested in Egypt um, since last summer's regime change. And, um, I th and I think that there are a lot of serious questions why I would have thought that the death sentence against the 183 Muslim Brotherhood supporters would also have been reason in, its, uh, reason in itself not to agree to send large, large quantities of weapons to Egypt. Well, I mean, it, it seems sort of incredibly um, ham-handed of the um, American government to make this announcement just at this time. I mean, mm -hmm. it seems so clumsy because it looks like a slap in the face to them by uh, the government in Egypt, doesn't it? I mean, I'd completely agree. And it has to be said, the Egyptian government has been routinely criticised and condemned by groups like Human Rights Watch, Amnesty International and Freedom House. Um, and it isn't just the US government that's been providing political support. Peter's right. The UK's role has been pathetic as well. It's been very, it's been very complicit. For example, we know that in February 2011, just after um, the Arab Spring, David Cameron flew out with senior representatives from BAE Systems, Quintec and Rolls-Royce, not in order to promote democracy in Egypt, but purely to sell weapons. Well, Peter, do you think this shows that actually the US is no longer the superpower that it claims to be, that it, it's, it's just losing influence? And look what's happening in Iraq as well. Um, well, there are loads of things suggesting that, the, uh, that we are in a post-hegemonic age. We're moving towards a more limited role for the United States. What I tend to think, however, is that the, the United States is still trapped in its relationship with Saudi Arabia. A lot of the things which have been happening in Egypt are dependent, you know, are, are attempts to secure the goodwill of the Saudis and the Gulf states, which have been behind the the, um, the new regime. And uh, I think, to some extent, the Americans and certainly the British are very keen not to um, to uh, to offend their Saudi allies. And I, that, to me, that's an unacceptable way of doing business. In we, we in Britain stand up for certain uh, values of of decency, of tolerance, and of freedom. Uh, and if we are, and these are British values, to use a phrase very much used by ten, uh, by, by the Prime Minister uh, David Cameron. And if we're going to abandon those values and, and ally ourselves with this kind of despotism, so what are we afraid of? What can Saudi Arabia do to us if we speak out more strongly? Well, I think that the problem is that they will be, that our arms, Andrew Smith's onto something here, our arms deals with, with Saudi, they supply us with oil, and we have a strategic alliance with them against Iran. This is, we have taken sides on this great uh, battle in the Middle East, or struggle, I think is a better word, between the, the Saudis and the and the Gulf states against uh, the Iranians. I don't know why we've done that, because it seems to me completely uh, bonkers, but there we are. And, um, and part of that is propping up this, uh, this terrible regime now in Egypt. Um, Mohammed, I mean, coming back to the Al Jazeera case, yeah. I mean, obviously Al Jazeera is based in Qatar. Yeah. Qatar was supporting the Muslim Brotherhood when yeah. they were in power in Egypt. So is this in some ways a, 
these harsh sentences, are they in some way a part of a sort of struggle between Egypt and Qatar? Actually, it's not Egypt and Qatar. What happened that I believe that Al Jazeera channel is it's a free, it's always unbiased, and and only because of she got the truth what's going on in Egypt and they struggle for this. This really all the journalists and and correspondents in Egypt they do very good job while before the coup. And, and before, and also while the revolution of 25th of January, and now is the time for the accounting between Egypt and Al Jazeera, because the people now, the rulers now, the 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 Kurita, the the junta, they want to punish Al Jazeera because the the Al Jazeera was from the first minutes in the 25th of January revolution, they want to stop it. It was beside the rebels from the beginning, from the first minute, and now is the time for accounting. They arrest a lot of journalists, including Al Jazeera journalists, and then it was like a hostage. Stop this strategy against Egypt, but they don't want to, to change their strategy. They're still working before the coup and after the coup. They're still working. And then they release two people, which is Mohammed Badr and Abdullah Shami. And here is the point. Now we release two people. Stop this kind of strategy. And then Al Jazeera never changed their strategy against what's going on in Egypt. And if not, then here is the point. This is verdict. Second day from uh, uh, John Kerr was in Egypt. Then they established the issue of these verdicts. Here we are serious. It's not a joke. We are serious. If you do not change, they talk not to Qatar. Yes, Qatar, they, they have a Muslim Brotherhood there, and Britain, they have Muslim Brotherhood, France, Canada, United States, everywhere. A lot of Muslim Brotherhoods and others, anti coup leaders, they flee to different countries, not only in Qatar. So you don't think it's an attack on the Qatar government, on the Emir of Qatar particularly? It's more on Al Jazeera? On Al Jazeera, itself. yes, yes. This is, this is uh, that the time to, to, to the accounting, because Ours, Al Jazeera was beside the rebels in Egypt, was in the sight of the protesters in Egypt against the dictatorial regimes. Can I just, uh, I think it's one thing, uh, speaking as a journalist and an observer of the scene, I, the, there are three uh, Al Jazeera journalists, look, there are 40 other Egyptian, at least, journalists. Yeah, they're still there. Yeah. Uh, uh, and uh, we mustn't forget that, uh, you know, the local journalists, there's something which disturbs me a little bit about Western reporting of this, is that we... Because we Al Jazeera is a, you know is well known name and we there's Peter Grest, yeah. but actually the local journalists are every bit as important, yeah. uh, and there's a sort of it troubles me. I mean, let's just stress that, mm -hmm. and then all the students and the activists who are in jails held unjustly, they're just as important as well. So That's something is a good point. But the, yeah. the reason why we're not only talking about the journalists of Al Jazeera today, we're also talking about these death sentences because yes, we also yeah. agree yeah. that. Yeah. One shouldn't sort of exaggerate it if you can, yeah. can, if you like. But let me ask you, as a, more as a political analyst rather than as a sort of journalist, I mean, how do you explain the fact that the government of Egypt talks about a road map to democracy? It says it's going to bring in elections uh, soon for parliament and all the rest of it. So they're trying to put on a democratic face, and yet they do something like this, where they are forcing Western foreign ministers to condemn them. Is, isn't it peculiar tactics? I, mean, I don't know. Yes, absolutely. I mean, because I have no doubt that uh, privately it will have been made plain to the uh, Egyptian regime by Britain, by the United States, by virtually everybody that they must release the journalists. Um, they haven't, uh, and therefore they've known what they're doing. And I think this is a uh, clearly a, 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 a sense that they can effectively defy decency. Uh, they have al alliances in the Middle East with Saudi, uh, which are going to support them. Um, the Americans have clearly given them, they don't believe th that the Americans mean it when they ask, they say that, you know, that they want them to release the journalists. And I, and I guess they're probably right. Uh, in other words, we're back to the kind of relationship which existed between dictatorships in the Cold War and the uh, and the the, the American um, America during that period, we we are. It's a very classic relationship where America uh, uh, claims to have a democracy at home uh, and supports despotisms overseas. Uh, and for those of us who believe in freedom and 
it's it's bad. To, it's a it's a despair. It's, you you've got to despair about it, because America here you are the great leader of the Western world, the great leader of the free world is supporting despotism, uh, and. What, how dare it do that? Given that this is the, you know, this, 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 this is the inheritors of the men who signed the Declaration of Independence. Well, let's let's have a final word from uh, Andrew Smith. I mean, do, do you see any likelihood that that some of these arms sales will be reduced or even reversed as a result of all this, or are we doomed to see the, the arms trade continuing as it is? Well, we know that last July um, a few of the licences were revoked, but. That come, but the UK arms policy can't be arms controlled by embarrassment. Why is it always takes a very high-profile human rights catastrophe before the UK stops selling arms to tyrants? And very often when arms sales are suspended, it's only for as short a time as possible or until the worst of the embarrassment or the potential for embarrassment is over. In, the last, in 2013 alone, the UK has licensed £51 million worth of weapons to the regime in Egypt. That was despite widespread criticism of the regime from a number of very reputable sources. But the, is it, but the issue does go way beyond that. Um, from the stats we, we've compiled from government reports, we found that actually last year in 2013, the UK licensed £2 billion worth of arms to oppressive regimes around the world. These OK, are... I think, let me just uh, cut you off there. I'm sorry, we're coming near the end. I just want to give Mohammed Sudan one final word. Do you think... General Sisi, the president now, will pardon Field these Marshal people. Marshal Sisi. Marshal, Field Marshal, yeah. Field Marshal. Field Marshal, Marshal yeah, that's right. will, will issue a presidential pardon, do you think, as a result of all these uh, slaps on the wrist he's had from, from Western governments? Today he gave a speech this morning. And then he said that nothing to do with the, uh, with the independent judiciary in Egypt. Nothing to do. And then whenever you uh, are sad or not, this is a law in Egypt. And we follow the law and we respect the law. We have independent 100% judiciary in Egypt. And these liars, they have nothing to do with this. Well, on that note, we've come to the end of today's programme. And indeed, this is the last programme for a few weeks as we're now breaking for Ramadan. I'd like to thank my guests and, of course, you at home for watching. Please tune in again for future discussions. And don't forget that you can keep up with the discussion by following us on Twitter at the address below on your screen or by following Islam Channel Current Affairs on Facebook. So wishing our viewers Ramadan Karim. Until then, thank you and goodbye.